Afternoon, uh, everyone. My name is Tom Gonzalez. I'm vegetable crop uh, specialist with uh, Manitoba Agriculture. Uh, welcome to the uh, final webinar of the 2021 Horticulture School March webinar series. Today's topic is pumpkin and squash production. Our uh, Horticulture School webinars, this uh, March series and uh, last year's 2020 series have been very well received and we're looking at potentially uh, hosting uh, more webinars in the future. Uh, we don't have details at this point but stay tuned for those details and uh, yeah just uh, we'll see how it works out. Our speakers today include myself, uh, John Gavlosky, the entomologist with Manitoba Agriculture, Vikram Bish, horticulture pathologist and Kim Brown, our weed specialist. Today's webinar, uh, we're going to try again to sort of do a question and answer format amongst uh, the presenters here. But also, we'd love questions from uh, you as attendees. And basically, I, if you have questions, if you could write them into the question and answer feature on the uh, GoToWebinar, then uh, Lori's going to facilitate those questions at the end of the of the presentation. Uh, as housekeeping, anyone who uh, is a certified crop advisor and uh, submitted their CCA number at the time when they you've registered, your attendance uh, will be submitted on your behalf for your credits. So basically, that's uh, the introduction out of the way. So I'm just going to get my screen working here. Okay. So, okay, uh, Tom, we hear that uh, some people are producing uh, pumpkins and squashes. Is it commercially uh, viable in Manitoba? And what are the other features? Right. Well, the short answer to that is definitely yes. I mean, uh, pumpkin is a uh, warm, warm season crop. Uh, they don't tolerate frost very well. You can have, uh, with big vines and big leaves, you can uh, have a frost that won't hurt the uh, pumpkins or the squash right away, but certainly will uh, get rid of all the uh, all the leaves. And then the next frost could affect your uh, your crop. Uh, if temperatures are uh, below 50 Fahrenheit, uh, plant growth is definitely affected and quality is uh, reduced as, as well. Uh, you can grow pumpkins on a wide variety of soils, but I would say, pumpkins and squash, sorry, I would say that the, the best way to uh, look, uh, or sorry, the best soil type would be just about any type other than heavy clays but what you really want is well drained soils in the sense of more like perfect drainage beneath your uh two to three feet of soil you, you don't want to uh have the roots uh wet they don't like uh when i say wet i mean soaked in water you, you want that uh either irrigation or rainfall to be able to uh, to drain away, not what isn't taken up. Um, so, Lori, could could you run the poll questions for me, please? I sure can. Thank you. So, the first poll is launched. Do you grow pumpkins commercially? Please select one. No. Yes, one to four point nine acres. Yes, 5 to 19.9 acres, or yes, 20 plus acres. So everyone can choose one and submit your your, question, your answers. We just have a couple more seconds here, and it looks like we're all in. If you do have a challenge entering a poll, you can just put your answer in the questions tab. All right. Here are your results. Uh, do you grow pumpkins commercially? No is 56%. 1 to 4.9 acres is 22%. 5 to 
5 to 19.9 acres is 11% and 20 plus acres is also 11%. Would you like me to launch the next one? Yes, if you could just go through all four of them, please. All right. All right, so our next poll, do you grow winter squash commercially? Please select one. No. Yes, 0 0.1 to 0 0.9 acres. Yes, 1 to 1 1.9 acres or yes, two plus acres. So if you could just submit your answer and, oh, that was a quick one, everyone's in there. So let's share the results. <clears throat> no is 80%, yes, 0 0.1 to 0 0.9 acres is 10%, 0 0% for the next one, and pl plus two acres is 10%. All right, we have two more. And do you grow summer squash commercially? So you can select one as well. No or yes, 0 0.1 to 0 0.9 acres. Yes, 1 to 1 1.9 acres or yes, 2 plus acres. Wow, everyone's voting fast. We appreciate that. Thank you. They're well trained. I know. We're doing great. All right, so your results for that one are no is 80%, yes is 20% for 0 0.1 to 0 0.9 acres, and the last two options were 0%. Okay. okay, everyone, we've got one more for you. And here it is. If you grow pumpkin or squash commercially, how do you market your crop? So if you did answer no, you can just leave this question. But if you did answer yes to any of those, please select one, direct to consumer, sell to retailers, or sell to wholesalers. Okay, so I think we'll probably have a lower percentage voted on this based on there'll be a few that do not answer. So we'll give it just a couple more seconds here and share the results. So direct to consumer is 50%, sell to retailers is 25%, and sell to wholesalers is 25%. So there you have your polls. Well, thank you very much, Laurie. Uh, yeah, that, uh, that's a little surprising in, in some of those uh, percentages uh, when I first uh, looked at it, but uh, yeah, uh, that's, in, that's interesting for us to know. So I guess uh, moving on here, we're going to get into uh, a little bit of the uh, to do with entomology right off the start uh, to accommodate uh, schedules today. So I'm just wondering, John, what what are the main insects that uh, that require uh, monitoring when uh, when growing? Uh, pumpkin or squash? Okay, yeah, good, good question, Tom. And actually, there, there's several insects that uh, are wise to keep an eye on. But there's really one that I would say is, I'll call it a bit, bit more critical, and that is something called the cucumber beetle. And as the name might imply, uh, cucumber beetle, it, it likes things in the cucurbit uh, family. So squash, pumpkin, cucumbers, that's what they feed on. And now there's actually, when I use the word cucumber beetle, there's actually a couple of different types. Uh, the one in the photo here, this one's called the striped cucumber beetle. And they're actually um, fairly easy to recognize. As the name might indicate, they've got stripes. They've got three black stripes on their yellow wings. So that striped cucumber beetle about six to seven millimeters long. There's also a second species that you, you might see, uh, maybe not quite as common, but it is called the spotted cucumber beetle. They're also yellow, their wings will be yellow, but instead of the three black stripes, they will have black dots on the wings. So those are your two species of cucumber beetle. I would start looking for these um, pretty much as soon as your, your transplant or you've got your your, your seedlings um, above the ground. So um, start 
probably, I guess it would be about mid-June would be a good time to start looking because really it's the seedlings where they can do the most damage. I've got my picture here of one feeding on, a, um, a, this is a, a pumpkin that it's feeding on making feeding scars. However, the seedling stage is really where they can do their most damage. Um, they will skeletonize the young plants and uh, they can cause direct loss by doing that, but they can also spread disease, which I'll go over in a minute. Um, the way their cycles work, it might seem like you get flushes of these beetles, but really they've only got one cycle or one generation per year. They overwinter as an adult, so you will start seeing them again probably in June, but it might seem like there's um, a, a really dragged out uh, adult emergence. They do emerge in these flushes, but it is just the one cycle per year that we get of them. Now I mentioned they will spread disease, so there's the disease called bacterial wilt. Um, it's quite a serious disease. It's a bacterial-based one, so you can't spray a fungicide. Obviously, fungicides don't work on bacterial diseases. Um, so really, there's no control for disease once the, the bacteria wilts in the plant. So really, your control for bacterial wilt is um, controlling the cucumber beetles. So that's another reason why you, you want to be monitoring for these beetles early in the season. They will stand out on the plants. They're again, yellow beetle, black stripes, they will stand out. So it's easy enough to be scouting for these and looking to uh, count what the numbers are like on your plant. And in just a little while, I'll give you what a threshold would be. But uh, again, I can't stress enough, uh, you, you do need to be on top of this because if they do start spraying the bacterial wilt, that can have some serious consequences for your crop. So here's a picture here. Um, my, uh, there's uh, a vegetable specialist in on Omafra in Ontario who sent me these photos. So they've had some experience dealing with bacterial wilt and cucumber beetles. So uh, I, you can see here on the squash um, the, the impacts of bacterial wilt. I don't know, Victim, are you planning on speaking of bacterial wilt later? Uh, it's not very common in our area, okay. so I'm not going to be talking oh, okay. about so it. I, I won't dwell on this too much then, as Victor mentioned, it's not too common here, but this is what it would look like. And this, again, another reason why you'd want to control your, uh, your uh, cucumber beetles. Just waiting for the slide to advance here. There we go. Um, so regarding cucumber beetles, uh, they, again, they're overwintering as adults and they will probably be entering your crop um from adjacent crops in the previous years so often you do get these edge effects where they'll be congregated sometimes around a particular edge of the, the patch or the field so um don't be surprised if you do see them being quite patchy now if they are patchy this provides you with an opportunity it means if you do need to control them um you but potentially don't have to be spraying your whole patch of squash or pumpkins. You might be able to get away with just doing uh, a patch or an edge treatment, especially if you're trying to reduce your, your use of insecticides. Uh, like I said, you, you may not need to do a whole field. Now, later I'm gonna talk about pollinators in um, squash and cucumber. And this might be a good time to remind you, this is a reason why it's good to scout for them early. And if you do need to control them to do it early, because you, you need pollinators in squash and pumpkins. You do not want to be applying an insecticide at flowering. You want to get that done prior to flowering. Later is okay, but not during flowering. And if you're ever in a situation where you think you need to during flowering, uh, please contact one of us. So we could probably try to direct you to what might be a more bee-friendly product. Unfortunately, there are bee-friendly products that will kill cucumber beetles. Beetles, they're just not registered in squash. <laughs> so that's the dilemma that we're in. So it is a tricky one. That's why we um, uh, advise you, again, scout early during the seedling stage if the cucumber beetles are high, uh, that's when to control them. And when I use the word high, what I'm talking about for a threshold here is if they're exceeding about 0.5 to one beetle per plant on average. Uh, if, now the, the guideline 
that they use in Ontario is that if you're using a bacterial wilt susceptible variety, you would use the lower end of that threshold, um, otherwise the higher end. Here where bacterial wilt maybe isn't as common, you can probably go with the higher end, probably about one beetle per plant. But again, be careful if they're getting much more than that because uh, their defoliation uh, uh, certainly can be an issue and as well the disease spreading. Especially when they're young, the plants. Especially when the plants are young and especially if the plants are growing under stress conditions. Yeah. If you um, if you get dry conditions, anything that really slows that early growth, it, it's the same battle that we deal with with flea beetles and canola and some of the other crops where they're being defoliated at a young age. Anything that slows that early growth is going to make the plants a bit more vulnerable. So that's a very good point. Um, also, I wanted to add here, the bacterial wilt is a problem in cucumbers and uh, the melons, but not as much as on the squashes and pumpkin. That is why we don't see it. Ah, okay, thanks, Vikram. Yeah. Yes. Um, Regarding later populations, uh, again, I mentioned don't be spraying during flowering. If you do start seeing them feeding directly on the pumpkins or squashes, what they can do is make these uh, brownish feeding pits on the surface. So you will get some scarring. Now, depending on the use, um, if you're growing pumpkins to be marketed based on their appearance, or squash, um, then this might be something you need to consider. Um, it's really not doing harm yield-wise at this point and uh, quality-wise. Uh, it, it's more of a surface thing, but it will affect the visibility. So um, and, and that might affect the marketability of your crop if you get too much of the scarring. So it, it certainly would affect marketability for any kind of uh, consumer market in the sense of table stock. Uh, you, consumers using it to cook. It wouldn't be a problem if you were uh, using it industrially as uh, turning it into, say, uh, powder to be an additive in food or something. Exactly. And if you're growing a few squash or pumpkin for your own use to make pies or whatever, it might not be a concern. But uh, but yes, if you're trying to market them, then uh, something you need to consider. Now, it's regarding other insects on squash and pumpkin. As far as the foliars go, uh, probably the other one, just to keep an eye on, is cutworm levels early in the season. Uh, and there's something that seems to go in cycles. The the species that we have here that affect our crops, we've got a couple like redback cutworm and dingy cutworm that are quite generalists and um, will feed on lots of things in your fields or gardens. Uh, the good thing is those species uh, do come above ground to feed. There's other species on other crops that feed more strictly below ground, but the ones that are more likely to be damaging your pumpkin and squash are species that do come above ground. So if you did have to control them with insecticides, you do have options. Now, most of the options are broad spectrum, um, but they are there. And again, I, I uh, suggest contact one of us if you're needing to pick something out. Now, the other insects just to be on the lookout for are mainly sap or fluid feeders. And for the most part, these are what we call secondary pests. They're not primary pests that uh, annually do great damage. And in fact, some of them, uh, their populations can be spurred on if you overuse insecticides. And the example I'll use for this is our aphids. So now aphids, uh, there's lots of species of aphids in Manitoba. Almost every crop will have one or more species that feeds on it, and there are a few that will feed on pumpkins and squash as well. Um, normally, the populations um, usually stay quite low until later in the season, and oftentimes when they do explode, it's because people have used insecticides to control other insects, knocked out all the natural enemies, and that enables the aphids to basically um, Reproduce unchecked. And with aphids, that's a bad thing. 
Now, in a field uh, of pumpkin and squash where you've got lady beetles, hoverflies flying around, um, damsel bugs running around, green lace wings flying around, maybe some pirate bugs in there, usually that suite of natural enemies plus some of the parasitoids are enough to keep things from becoming overly economical. But again, if you don't have those good natural controls working in your favor, that's when things can really explode. And that's again where we do recommend um, using insecticides only when needed. And again, if you can use things that are somewhat selective versus broad spectrum, that's even better. Now, if by chance you do get an aphid or a spider mite problem, and you don't want to be spraying something that's going to be killing bees and things, you do have options for aphids. Um, insecticidal soaps. Um, you, you'll see the term on the labels, potassium salts of fatty acids. That's insecticidal soap. And you can buy that commercially or you can make a batch yourself. Um, it, it depends on the, uh, the, the acres that you're doing. But if it really is just uh, a small patch, you can buy or even make a batch of insecticidal soap. As long as you hit the aphids, you will get good control. The tricky part with insecticidal soap is you do need to make some contact. So uh, that might involve, in the case of a plant with big leaves where aphids can get underneath. So yeah. That's the tricky part using insecticidal soaps is yeah. getting it to them. Right. There are some commercial aphicides that are meant to kill aphids and not much else. And some of them are available in pumpkin and squash. Um, so again, if you if you do have those issues, uh, contact us and we can direct you to some of those products as well. So John, you were alluding to a little earlier in one of your slides uh, about the, the pollinators. So, so how essential are pollinators to uh, pumpkin and squash production? And, and sort of what would the main pollinators be? Yeah, and see, that is a really, really good question. And um, it really, it, the, the short answer is pollinators are vital to squash and pumpkin production. You won't get a yield unless you've got pollinators, period. So they're vital, they're crucial, you need them. Um, the main pollinators that are going to benefit your crop vary with the region and our our, the answer to that question here in Manitoba is different than it will be in Ontario and further south. But first, a little lesson on pumpkin flowers, because this is something that's interesting, just, just to understand uh, how pollination works in pumpkin and squash. So pumpkin and squash, they produce both male and female flowers on the same plant. Um, the male flowers are producing both pollen and nectar. And with the females, it's just nectar they're producing. Obviously, the females aren't producing the pollen. That's the job of the male flowers. So you need to get that pollen from the male flowers into the female flowers. So it has to make its way down to the ovary uh, in those female flowers for you to start getting your pumpkins and squash. So if you have poor pollination, um, you'll either have small, unmarketable fruit or, or very little fruit at all. And pumpkin flowers do, and squash flowers do not bloom for a long time. So you've got just a short window that this pollination can occur. So bottom line, you need um, a good suite of pollinators uh, present and working in your pumpkin and squash patch or field while that flowering is occurring. Now, naturally that is probably occurring. Um, but it can vary from region to region, depending on your native bee population and previous insecticide use patterns. There's a few factors that could uh, affect that. Now, um, interestingly enough, um, I was reading something out of Ontario where they had done a survey asking people what they thought the main pollinators were in pumpkin and squash. Most people said honeybee, which is probably a good answer. But in Ontario, it's probably not the case, and here it's probably not the case. That's not to say that honeybees can't pollinate pumpkin and squash. Um, they can, but they're not one of the more efficient pollinators. So if a person is using honeybees, you can 
stock your um, fields with beehives and and they will get the job done. They're just not as efficient a pollinator as something like a squash bee would be or bumblebees. Those are probably your two better squash and pumpkin pollinators. Uh, the pollen in pumpkin and squash gets large, it's sticky, it's spiny, and it's really not that attractive to honeybees. So if the honeybees have something more attractive uh, nearby, or it, that more attractive pollen and nectar might even be weedy growth within or outside your field, they may end up spending more of their time on those crops or plants. So that's the tricky part with pollinating pumpkins with honeybees. Um, like again, they're just not the most efficient. Now in Ontario, where they did that survey, um, by far the best pollinator is something called the squash bee, and they call them squash bees for a reason. They pretty much evolved to pollinate squash and pumpkin plants. They're drawn to them, that's their preferred choice. Um, they, wherever pumpkin and squash are grown um, in southern parts of Canada and much of the US, there seems to be a big enough population that they're getting the job done. And uh, between them and bumblebees, um, those are going to be your main pollinators. Some people might choose to supplement the pollination with honeybees. Um, and one study out of Cornell, um, they showed that at times that honeybee supplementation wasn't really even necessary. Um, but again, probably depends on your operation and what's, what the native bee population is like. But at times these native pollinators can get the job done. Now, I talked to Jason Gibb at the University of Manitoba. Now, Jason Gibbs, he's a pollination biologist. And I wanted to know, how do we have squash bees in Manitoba? And his answer was that probably not, although no one's really done a good survey of it. Um, but there aren't any in the University of Manitoba collection. There have, there's no records of them from Manitoba. Now, Jason did not say resounding no, but he did say, again, we just haven't been looking. So um, if anybody is growing pumpkins and squash and they're interested to know what's pollinating, um, either myself or Jason or possibly either Tom might be yeah, willing to, <laughs> to, or a student might be willing to come and have a look at what is um, on your pumpkins or squash. Um, if by chance you're out there and you notice during the day that, um, Sometimes you get these uh, crinkled um, flowers and you'll find the bees right inside the crinkled flowers. That's what squash bees like to do. They like to get right inside the flowers and when they start to kind of crinkle and shrivel and um, it almost makes a nice home for them. And so you'll find them right inside the flowers. So if you're peeling back flowers and for any reason and looking and noticing that there's bees in there, um, give us a call because we'd like to come out and grab a sample because they, if they are squash bees, we want to know that they're there. The assumption that we have though right now, uh, based on what Jason told me, is that probably bumblebees here are one of the um, primary bees pollinating your pumpkin and right. squash. They're native, we've got different species of them. They're very efficient. They don't mind cooler weather. Um, they're not deterred by the nectar and pollen and uh, pumpkin and squash they're a more efficient pollinator than honeybees will be and again that doesn't mean that some of you may want to uh, supplement the pollination but if you've got a healthy bumblebee population they may get the job done and there's some other native bees as well jason gave me the name of this one here uh melisodes by maculatus mm -hmm. and apparently they're also very good at pollinating things like pumpkin and squash uh they're the type of longhorn bees so they got fairly long antenna and quite black, but you can see their back legs. Um, that's where they're collecting the pollen and uh, it's bringing it from uh, male to female flowers. This isn't pumpkin and squash, but I'll say right. Melisodes by macula. So those, that, those would be the main pollinators here. But again, to stress, the pollinators are, are critical. Do whatever you can to help them out. Don't be spraying during flowering. Um, try to do whatever you can to ensure that you get good pollination because really um, that's what's going to help you get a good yield. Right. 
Um, Lori, we didn't talk about this beforehand, but with John G having to uh, another commitment here, were there any questions that came in to do with uh, the insect portion he's talked about? No, nope, I don't have any questions right now. And if any questions do come in on insects, I can always email them to John and he can answer them via email. And we will try our best to answer them without John even, you know, but uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah, okay. I'll, well, I'll be scooting soon, but yes, I, uh, if anyone has questions, they can certainly send them in and yep. we'll make sure we get them out. Did you give your cell phone number? We can call <laughs> it on your On vacation? <laughs> Okay, well, thanks, John. Um, okay, so we're, we're gonna get back on to agronomy here a little bit. Okay, uh, Tom, so now that we know that uh, pollination is very important and uh, uh, we have some possibility of growing commercially, what are the varieties that we can grow here successfully? Well, that, that's a great question because for, for pumpkin, for varieties, they differ even in close, growers that are in close proximity to one another may be growing different varieties. Uh, pumpkin's very uh, robust uh, plant. Once it gets going, it can be a bit of a chore to get going. Um, there's a wide selection of varieties. Just to, th these are not necessarily even the most common now, but what I wanted to do was show, I use Howden as an example for what I would call a large pumpkin. Um, 25, 20 pounds plus probably, for sure, maybe even 25 plus. Um, a carving pumpkin, uh could be as small as uh, seven pounds can go up to maybe 15 or so pounds uh i would say seven to nine pounds might be the standard smaller is better hijinks is is one variety that fits in there now i threw this one in it's not that common commercially but the amazing thing about neon the variety neon is almost as soon as that fruit sets, it's orange. The only thing that needs to mature on it is size. Once you, like I say, it's not, it is green for a little bit, but I mean a very little bit. It's not like your standard pumpkins uh, that I've listed up there where some years you're going, holy crap, are they going to uh, turn orange? Well, you don't have to worry about that with neon. But again, there are, it, it's not necessarily a variety for everybody, but if you're growing pumpkins and you're wanting to guarantee some, uh, no matter what the year is like, in the sense of uh, how many frost-free days you got at the back end, you wanna be sure you have some mature pumpkins, this is, uh, that would be an option to use. So what are some of the, winter squash types that uh, we can grow here. Right, so I, I think basically when it comes to winter squash, you know, there's this, there's butternut, uh, spaghetti squashes, acorn squashes, there's a variety, there's Hubbard, there's, we, we could go on and on, but it's kind of like pumpkin in a way where you, the varieties, the particular varieties in use vary widely from farm to farm, grower to grower. There's not a standard uh, variety or two or even three or more that everyone is growing. So it's it's not very easy to pick out uh, to pick out varieties. Now, the retail market has has changed. Like what the retail market's demanding over the last uh, few years, uh, you know, ten plus years. They, they, they want a generally smaller sized uh, uh, squash. You go into a uh, retail uh, produce, uh, retail store produce section now, and you're not gonna find 20 pound uh, butternut squashes. You're gonna find, you know, three pound, two and a, uh, three and a half pound, in, in two and a half pound, in, in that range kind of thing. For the consumer, that's what the consumer wants or the majority of consumers want. So that's 
that's where the demand uh, demand is, and you want varieties that are going to do that. Okay, uh, which one of these three do you prefer to eat yourself? Well, for me, I'm the butternut uh, person. Let's go around the room. Kim? Um, I like zucchini for baking, and I like butternut probably to eat. Okay, Kim, if you couldn't hear that, Kim said uh, butternut for winter and uh, zucchini for summer. John G? Uh, for me, it's uh, pretty much a tie between butternut and acorn squash. Okay, John G is a tie with butternut and acorn, and Vikram, you have to weigh in. Uh, butternut, and I didn't know how to cook the spaghetti squash, so I made a boo boo there. <laughs> Can I say something again? I do like the spaghetti squash for people that have a gluten intolerance. It's uh, the spaghetti squash is a wonderful alternative for gluten intolerant people or gluten or people with celiacs. And once you learn how to cook them, which there's several ways, it's on the internet, Vikram. <laughs> um, they actually cook up really nice, and they they're very nice, and they're quite easy to make, and uh, a very good choice. That was a very good, very good point. Yes. Yes. Now we'll just uh, go to the next topic. Is what is this summer squash varieties that we have? Okay, well, we, we got a little sneak preview there when my thumb accidentally went ahead there, but okay. uh, now we're back on track. Um, for, the, for the summer squashes, certainly zucchinis are, are the most common summer squash grown. There are other ones, patty pan, things that are, are not, as, not as common. Um, when it comes to the types of squaw of uh, zucchinis the variegated uh, ones and yellow ones are probably the most saleable the old standard dark green zucchini you can still find it around but the demand for it is certainly less than either yellow or variegated uh, zucchini and again just exactly the same thing as with the winter squashes the retail market, the consumers who are shopping in that retail market have demanded from their stores, and hence those stores demand from growers, a smaller size. So you're not going to see that huge zucchini that you once had in your in your uh, on your counter going, what the heck am I going to do with 20 pounds of zucchini kind of thing? You know, it's a much smaller size. So uh, based on your on use or for marketing you're going to be growing some of these uh, squashes or pumpkins how do you decide which variety and what are the other things like uh, the uh, maturity of the crop that uh, will influence a decision right well um what when it comes to manitoba the thing to remember here is that unless disease or uh, uh, some kind of grazing pest or insect pest takes your crop down, they're, they're gonna keep growing. Like they're, we don't have enough frost-free days for them to die naturally. So you, you want to be sure that maturity is uh, when it comes to pumpkins and squashes, zucchinis, I mean, they'll be, <laughs> they'll be flowering forever it seems so you're almost happy to see a frost but uh when it comes to the uh, winter squashes and pumpkins you want to be sure to pick varieties that will uh have enough frost free days to develop and again i've said it a few times and i'm not trying to slam people who sell seed for a living but don't always believe what you're told in days to maturity like try first on your farm just to be sure what uh what's going on there but but i guess the one of the the questions that we have to think about is what what is maturity like when we say that like days to maturity what 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 is that um i i think in squashes it's marketability and john in his insect presentation alluded uh to it somewhat, um, it's it's how it looks. Uh, size is important, color is important, but if it is scarred up from insects or uh, hail or even heavy rain, um, it's it's 
it's not going to be marketable. So there are some physical characteristics, size, color, but also just general aesthetics. It's got to look nice on the shelf because very few, if any, of our uh, pumpkin squashes are going to any kind of processing. They're going to a, a, a market where a consumer is buying it. Okay, now, uh, Marlin, one question about the desirable traits of uh, the pumpkin right. and squashes and yeah. uh, what do you say? Yeah, okay, so I, I guess the question is, what, what are we looking for in, in a variety? You know, uh, end, the primary end use is basically carving here in Manitoba. Some people are gonna make the odd pie out of it, but it's not like we have a huge processing industry. So if it's carving, what do you need? You need a good size solid handle on it. Like, you know, let, let's let's be honest there. You don't want a stubby handle and you don't want it uh, breaking off easily. So uh, uniform color and in pumpkin, obviously it's orange. Uh, when it comes to carving, I mean, it's orange. And that kind of ticks back to my comment in the variety uh, sec section where we talked a little bit about varieties now that are uh, orange almost from the get-go. Um, for carving, you want a uniform shape. Uh, I don't know how many of you would have gone to a, a big box store at around uh, pre-Halloween time, but you see those uh, shipping uh, pallets outside cardboard uh, boxes with uh, pumpkins in them for sale, and you look in there, they're, they're very uniform. Uh, I would say most of them are going to want to be 10 to 12, 13 pounds, but I, I put 7 to 15 pounds because there is going to be a bit of a wider spec uh, for some uh, some buyers, but sort of 10 to 12 pounds is is probably, uh, probably what everybody wants. Um, I'd say test varieties. You want to see what works on your farm. Uh, so try new uh try new variety but don't uh, plant uh, three quarters of your acreage to it uh just see how it goes um again just some pictures there's howden i mentioned it before it's a big old pumpkin um huge it can get to 40 pounds easily uh look at the shape it's not uh very uniform but back in the day that was uh that was what it was and here's some neon uh nice handles uh quite uniform shape uh it, it's a nice pumpkin um again you might pay a lot for the seed though uh so keeping on traits winter squashes again shape color size R retail is is now generally under three pounds some of them will be in the five six pound range but generally a light uh a lighter uh winter squash now if you're selling d direct to consumer uh say at a farmer's market or the end of your lane or s something along those lines the cons the customer may want a a big uh, a, a big squash like they say used to get 30 years ago in their garden or whatever you know so just because the retail market demands a certain uh, spec doesn't mean that uh, there's going to be a problem for larger ones in some markets. Uh, just trying to get it to advance here. There we go. Okay. So again, I'm coming back to not, I, I don't have uh, any one variety to tell you that this is the one to try, but what I would say is Pick ones that uh, look by frost-free days that they're going to work, and by the uh, description, they're what you think you can sell. And plant uh, some in your on your farm and test them, see how they look. And if they look good, ramp up the volume a little bit. So here's from some of our trials, not the last uh, year because of COVID, but here's some butternut on the left and some spaghetti on the right. I believe that's uh, Tavoli. Uh, Variety is the spaghetti squash, and I'm not sure of the uh, butternut variety. Um, and here, someone who I, we gave a uh, squash to decided, uh, I don't know how many of you 
remember the minions there, but they made a minion out of one of the butternut squashes. So I just had to throw that in there. Uh, the summer squashes, again, uh, same kind of deal, uniform, color, size, shape. Uh, but here, it's even smaller. I mean, there, there's a speck out there. I'm not sure it's the most common, but there's a speck out there that's 12 ounces for a zucchini. I mean, that, that's, that's really light. There's also specks over a pound, but a fairly saleable uh, commercial uh, speck is 12 ounces. So again, if you're selling direct to consumer, that's going to be variable. Some people want big honking zucchinis, you know, maybe they're going to grind them up and make muffins or whatever. But in the retail uh, stores, it's much smaller. Again, like everything else, test varieties on your farm. And here's some pictures, again, not from last year because of COVID, but um, this uh, yellow one would be a little out of spec. It's too big, too long uh, for retail. This uh, one lower on the green one is, uh, again, out of spec. It's a little long. And this one probably weighs as much. Uh, it's a variety called San Isidro. It probably weighs as much as the uh, ones on the left, but it's chunkier, hence it's shorter. So depending on the spec, this might fall into a spec uh, because of its length. Uh, so yeah, that's where we are. Okay, so now that we have selected the varieties or the choices that we can make, if we grow, how do we grow it successfully? Do we need irrigation or we right. can we do without? Well, it, irrigation isn't required by, by any means. But having said that, if you don't have adequate moisture during the growing season, you're gonna lose potential in both yield and quality. So it's not to say you, you have to have irrigation to make it work. But if you wanna maximize the return, yes. Now, in a perfect world, if you have irrigation, you'd be using it and you'd want to irrigate at least an inch after either seeding or transplanting. Uh, another time that, that moisture is critical, obviously, is at flowering and uh, early fruit development. So basically, if you think of a zucchini, that means the entire summer because it's just flowering stick kind of thing. So uh, summer squashes really benefit. Uh, in the sense of yield and quality from uh, good moisture. Okay, <clears throat> now we have decided yeah. Sorry about that, that uh, we need irrigation. We have decided the varieties that we need to choose. Right. What about the nutrients and the soils that we need for a good production? Okay, uh, yeah, sorry about that folks. I lost the... Uh, it's got to get through. I'm going to do something else. We'll go and show here. My apologies. I'm just going to find the slide and go to it rather than bother you with clicking through everything. Uh, okay. Here we go. Again, my apologies for that. Just got to get uh, my technology uh, working here. Okay. Sorry about that. So the the soils that are uh, best suited are a variety of soils. I alluded to it in that first slide where I wanted to get across the idea that drainage is so important. Um, so basically most soils, except the heaviest textured soils would be okay. So whether it's uh, sandy loams through to loamy soils, uh, loamy clays, even, you know, the, the big thing you want is you want those soils to be reasonably well drained that's going to be the key element to the whole uh the whole thing so what about the fertility how do you decide what to use how to okay well in general there i'm going to say do a soil test uh for those of you who know our soil fertility specialist that would maybe be his mantra so i don't want to be accused of copying his mantra, but I agree with it 100%, so I'm gonna say it. Um, and 
as a side note, all vegetable crops, no matter what you're growing, get a soil test done. It's not expensive. You'll be happy in the long run if you get it done. So if you're going to do a soil test, there's basically a few companies that you can use in no particular order. Farmer's Edge, a Labs, Agvise Labs, a uh, little difference in how they physically present the numbers and do a little bit of the testing, but they're all very good at what they do. So there's no issues there. Um, okay, so cost-wise, if you got a full meal deal, so to speak, you got all your nutrients done, you got uh, uh, salinity, uh, everything you could think of, I'd be very surprised if you paid more than 50 bucks for that test. Um, now, when we get tests done, we're getting more tests done than just one soil test, so we're paying a little less than uh, than some would pay if you just have a couple of tests to do. But 50 bucks would be the max. 30 to 50 bucks, I would think, for the full meal deal. You could get less than 20 just to get uh, NPK test done. Okay, so. Can you just talk about the fertilities that we need for right. NPK? Yeah. So again, we're going to assume you get a test done. So when you get your test done, there'll be a recommendation on there to uh, to have uh, X pounds of uh, of nitrogen, uh, phosphorus, and potassium on there. In general, and this is very general, you're going to be 60 to 30 pounds of N per acre. And you can split that up though. Uh, you could do half of it up front as a broadcast, and you could do half of it as a side dress once the vines, not when your field's solid with the uh, vines, but once they start to run from the center of where you planted them, you could then go in and uh, side dress in 50% of what you needed for N. It's going to be pretty similar for phosphorus in the in the sense that uh, you'll get your uh, soil test back they'll give you an idea of what you want we have very high pea soils in manitoba so it is possible they're going to recommend no no pea and depending on the year and what your soil is it could be up to 75 pounds of pea in the recommendation um there these rates here that i've talked about are based on using p205 broadcast as the source of your P. Now, that kind of, those rate, those numbers will go out the window if you're banding, because banding is much more efficient. So if you're banding, you're never really going to be putting on 100 or 75 pounds, uh, it, it, unless you had like really bad shortage of P or something. So just remember, if you're banding phosphorus, your rates are going to come down from what they are for broadcast. Um, for potassium, basically, again, from your fertilizer test, you're going to get a number. And again, our soils are generally quite good in uh, in K, so you might get it where they say you don't need to apply any, uh, but it could be up to 125 pounds. Th these numbers are very general. I'm not saying to you, go out and add 125 pounds or go out and add zero. Use your soil test, see what you have in reserve in the soil, then from what you need to make the crop, do the calculation. Some of the growers may have access to compost or manure. How would they adjust? Or... No. Okay, so uh, again, the, the, the only issue with that is knowing or having an idea, you don't you don't have to know with certainty, but having a bit of an idea of what the analysis of that uh, compost would be in the way of fertility. So there again, you can get those uh, those numbers from a supplier. Sometimes, if you're making your own compost, you could look at having that tested to see what's available in the way of nutrients so commercial ones may have that information and your own you could get that so you can adjust your things that's right okay. you'd, you'd get a bit of an idea of uh how much to put on there yeah 
So again, the idea of uh, if your banding comes into effect when you're putting on K, because the 125 to zero pounds, I was talking in terms of K2O broadcast as your fertilizer source or your source of K. So if you band it, you could uh, reduce your rates uh, accordingly, much like phosphorus in there. So I think we're going to switch gears a little bit here and uh, move into uh, move into weed control. Uh, one of the one of the things when it comes to growing uh, vine crops, pumpkins and uh, and squashes, is certainly the uh, potential for weed control to be an issue simply because uh, they're not gonna fill in right away. So I guess the, the primary question is how the heck am I gonna control the weeds? Uh, yeah, <laughs> and that's not a, it's, it's difficult. I mean, it's not, this is definitely not something that's really easy and there's really no easy answer. So I just thought um, I'll go through a few of the things. Uh, oops, this is not. Oh, sorry. Sorry, sorry. Sorry, that's no. my bad. So, for control of weeds, mm -hmm. can growers use mulch? Yes, yeah, and I'll actually, that's one, that's actually a very good uh, thing to do if that works for you. It doesn't work for everybody, but I think if you're doing pumpkins or squash on any sizable scale, then you can be using mulch, and that is definitely something that's a very good idea. Um, there's other reasons, too, to use mulch. Um, the It helps warm up the area. This is a crop that uses a lot of heat, right? So that whole, there's other advantages to using mulch. A big one is that it keeps the weeds down. Um, so yeah, so again, a lot of our weed control, um, I've just, some of the factors affecting weed control, field selection is really crucial or the site selection. So you want to avoid fields with heavy weed infestations. Now, having said that, anytime you till the ground, you're going to have weeds come up, but knowing what you had there before, if you've always had a really bad quackgrass problem, or if there's some weeds in there that have always been problematic, um, and especially the perennial weeds, they are harder to control in general. Uh, and this is something that now, whether or not you um, want to be using some type of chemical control, but you can definitely come in with a non-selective herbicide, something like a glyphosate um, or, or um, something like that. And you can come in and you can do some sprays before you do any planting at all. And, and those, there's no soil residual on something like a, like a glyphosate or what you might re refer to as Roundup. But um, you can come in, there's not going to be any soil activity. It's not going to be um, getting into the crop. It's inactive once it hits the soil. So it's only going to kill the weeds that are up. So that might be something that you're interested in if you're not opposed to using some type of weed control. So for weed identification, it's important if you're using chemical control, it's important to know what's there because there are some products, There's the products are limited and I'm gonna cover that at the end of the presentation, but um, you need to know what you're trying to kill because you might be using just the wrong product or you might be very limited and if, if the majority of your weeds are something that our products aren't really touching, then at that point, you know, you're looking at a different form of control, not chemical control. Weeds can also be hosts for disease or insect pests. And I think Vikram may cover some of that or, or some of the, the diseases or the insects okay. as well. So again, knowing what weeds are there, knowing knowing that, that just the, the yield loss from the weeds um, is one thing, but they may also be vectoring diseases or they may be a host for some of the insects that will um, that will hurt your crop as well. And one of the best things you can do for weed control is a good vigorous crop. So um, an aggressive, healthy crop will outcompete the weeds. And this is true for almost any crop we grow. Um, and so then all the aspects of growing that good crop, which Tom has been covering, which um, which John Gavlosky has been covering and Vikram has been covering, um, proper irrigation, fertilization, disease and insect management, basically grow the best crop you can on all those fronts. And that makes the best kind of weed control if you have a, a really good vigorous crop. Having said that, you're still going to have weeds because you, you're starting with black dirt um, and probably there's just going to be some weeds grow. So different methods of weed control, um, hand weeding or using a hoe. This is best when the crop and the weeds are small to reduce your crop damage. You don't want to be in there, especially with the hoe. Uh, you don't want to be in there causing any damage. Um, that, that anytime you're damaging vines or damaging plants, this is an, um, an opportunity for diseases to get in there 
and that type of thing and we don't want to be in there also the smaller the weeds are the less they're competing for light and nutrients and moisture and that type of thing so it's best to get them get rid of them as soon as possible um, removing weeds with large root systems can damage your crop roots or vines and i think we all know that if we've been hand pulling <laughs> weeds out of a garden um, you can do a lot of damage to some of the crops around them especially if some of the the other plants are quite delicate and so we but and also by then if the weeds are getting really big we don't they've done damage already in like i said they're competing for light and water and nutrients and uh, that's going to affect our crop yield um, mechanical control would be is effective but it's limited to small weeds so basically anything that you want to be able to to cut um, or, or cover um, just smother basically with the dirt thrown over top of it or kind of slice them off as you're coming through with the cultivators um, really you only do this until the crop begins to vine because those vines are really tender and they're very easily damaged and we don't want to harm our, our crop in any way um, you would still needing to need to be hand weeding within the row because you can only get so close to the actual plants themselves so you're going to be able to get the bulk of the plants in between the rows um, and something that I, I came across is that if you plant at equidistant spacing so that's the same in the row and between the row that would allow you to cultivate from a number of different angles or a different direction until the vining starts so that would be something that would make it maybe a little bit easier you could go in a couple of different directions there um, Plastic mulch is a very effective weed control, and I think that this is probably the best way to get everything started if that works for you. If you're planting from transplants, obviously, if you're direct seeding, then this is um, not going to work. Um, but black or light eliminating um, mulch is the best so that the weeds can't grow underneath, uh, basically, and they also will help absorb light and help our, our plants, our, our crop grow better. Uh, the plastic should be tight fitting and sealed along the edges to prevent wind disturbance we don't want to see this thing uh flapping in the wind and start to take off in the big wind storms that we've been prone to having the last few years um but and the more it needs to be sealed too because we just want to have a barrier basically it's a physical barrier to the weeds growing um and again it's got lots of other benefits as well Make the smallest hole possible for transplanting because you will have weeds growing when you put those transplants in, you will have weeds growing right next to them. When you disturb weed soil, sorry, there is weed seeds in that soil and they are going to grow. So uh, as little disturbance within that mulch as possible is, is the best thing. And if you're spraying between the beds, only use registered herbicides, which I'm going to get to in a minute. Um, the roots will grow beyond the beds and they'll grow into the middle where that soil was treated. So you can't be spraying something in between the mulch uh, let rows uh, that isn't safe for the pumpkins or the squash because that could be disastrous. Uh, once those roots grow in there, that's not good. So we still have to maintain the, our weeds between the rows and you could again do some cultivation between um, the rows of plastic you could as long as you're not damaging that mulch that is something you can do or again you could be spraying in there too to take care of those weeds but that will give you a nice bed for um, those pumpkins and squash to grow on and Tom what's a mulch layer usually about three four feet yeah 48 well like 48 inches is a pretty standard uh, width for a mulch roll um, when you account for the the, the sides going in uh, to the, the sides coming down, say a raised bed or that 30 inch, 36 to 30 inches, maybe as low as 28 is the width that you have to plant in mm -hmm. because of the, the plastic coming down on the side and then needing to be sealed into the ground. So mm -hmm. you, you've got two and a half feet yeah. to three feet. Yeah, which is a really nice you know that's going to give you a really nice area that will not have weeds in it other than the like where you've actually poked those transplants in so if this is a method that works for you this is you know probably going to work really really well to get the majority of the weeds out of those rows so chemical control we have really limited options there, there really isn't a lot um for basically though i you we've got everything we've got soil applied broadleaf and then broadleaf and grass and then we also have post-emergent grass herbicides so our soil applied broadleaf herbicide so this is something that you're going to spray on the soil and you're going to incorporate and you're going to um 
um, and it's going to it's going to kill the weed seeds as they emerge. So your soil applied herbicides don't kill weeds that are up already. So this is something that if there's already weeds up, it's not going to kill them. So this is going what you're going to be basically doing kind of first thing. And there's some residual that comes from these this chemistries, and they're going to help you. Um, that's going to last a little bit longer into the growing season until those plants get going and they start to cover the ground themselves and choke out the weeds. So our soil applied broadleaf herbicide, our Sandia, um, it's it's just straight broadleafs. It won't do any grass herbicides at all. Um, the one thing to watch with this one, it has a Canada-wide registration, um, and but it has a long recrop interval for canola and for sunflowers. So if you've got a pumpkin patch on the edge of a field or someplace where you were planning on growing either of those two crops, um, this is something that you have to be a little bit careful of. And we do have this registered in field crops as well. And we do, again, it's, it's called permit. If anybody has seen that, it's the same thing, just a different name, uh, trade name on it. But we do have to be careful with that, with that canola recropping because we grow a lot of canola in Manitoba. Right. And so some of these pumpkin fields might be a little bit bigger or they might be, again, on the edge of, 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 a, of an agricultural field. And that's just something to keep be aware of. Um, when we're looking at our soil applied broadleaf and grass herbicides, so these are herbicides that are going to do some grasses, and they both do a really good job on grasses, like your typical um, grass weeds that we would see. Um, and then certain of the broadleaf weeds are the pig weeds and the, the lamb's quarters and those type of things um, that we normally would see in our gardens. Um, these are, these are there's dual 2 magnum and there's Devrinol. Um, so these are things that you could uh, look for. and um, we don't have a guide for you guys to look at, but I, if you did want to contact me, I can get you in touch with the PMRA label site. You can download a label and you can see if you want a label um, and if you wanted more information about actually using the chemical and how to use it and the rates and that type of thing. So there are labels available online and there is, we, we do get some information from other guides in, in other provinces and that type of thing, but we do have to make sure that these are still labeled Canada-wide or labeled for use in Western Canada. And unfortunately, we, we don't have as many things, right. as many chemists, much chemicals labeled in Western Canada as they do say in Ontario or uh, even across the border into yep. the States. We just, the, the work hasn't been done, so we don't have those yep. registered in Western Canada. So it is, you do need to be careful that it does have a Canada-wide label. So um, when it comes to post-emergence, you really don't have any broadleaf chemistry to, uh, to speak of. Um, so your broadleaf weed control is going to come from what you put down as a pre-emerge herbicide, so on those weed seeds as they emerge from the weed seed. Um, but post-emergent, so this is for grasses that are already up, and we do have a sure or its lookalikes. There's some, um, there's some uh, like many, there's several um, uh, generic pro, uh, products for both of these, and then post ultra, which is Cefoxidim and, and Assures Quizalifop. So there is other brand names of those. There's some generics. Those are both the group one. They'll do a really good job on your grass weeds, whatever grass weeds are there. And as long as you're in the right staging, it'll say like two to six leaf on the weeds, or it's usually better to get them when they're small. Um, they those both have a 30 day pre-harvest interval. And so I'm sure you would have lots of time on that. You don't want to be spraying that within 30 days of harvest. Um, the only thing with this is those are both the group one, which means um, we've got, um, the problem with that is that we do have some group one resistant wild oats and, and, and that type of thing in the province. So you may have some resistant weeds, but I'm hoping the acres of pumpkins and squash are small enough. I don't think that's a big issue, but that just is something to be careful of because we do have some resistance. And unfortunately, our grass herbicides are both group one. So, so that's all I had. Like I said, they're very limited on, on right. chemistries. Um, I, have, I have a small comment here. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> After you have laid down your mulches, mm -hmm. there is a, a wide open space mm -hmm. between the between. mulches. Mm -hmm. Can you have a pre-plant uh, Roundup application in there? If you wanted to, if it's on something like a Roundup or a glyphosate, yeah, if that's if you wanted to spray that, that would be fine. It's going to be inactive the minute it hits the soil. You could keep that black in between the mulch layers um, or in between your mulch, uh, you could keep that black all season, um, either through cultivation or through a glyphosate application. It's just your choice whether or not you want to be spraying herbicides or not. Some right. people choose not to or pre-plant. 
Yes, and there actually is a few other, there's a, a few other burn-off uh, chemistries as well that you can use pre-plant, but they don't have any residuals, so they will only spray what's up. There's another one, I don't have it on the slide, it's called AIM, um, and it will do some broadleaf weeds, but it is pre-plant, and it's only on what's there at the time you spray, so it doesn't last at all. So it has to be anything green that's up, you right. definitely can kill that first. The the one thing when it comes to mulch that you see a lot <laughs> when you're, say, uh, uh, rotivating or cultivating between the mulch rows before the plants uh, get to run. Um, you, you're not going to, no matter how good a driver you are, you're not going to be right on top of that mulch. You're going you're gonna to have a couple inches. Mm -hmm. And if you're a worse driver, you're going to have a foot. So it just, and <laughs> that line is going to be green, green with weeds. Potentially. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, yeah. I have another question. Mm -hmm. In some places, uh, vinegar is being uh, promoted. Yep. What are yep. your comments on that? Yeah, there is definitely um, acetic acid is is what's the the what's vine what vinegar is. There is I'm not sure if it's still called Eco Clear. There are def there are more than one brand name of it. It is a commercial formulation of vinegar. It is stronger than household vinegar though. Um, and it does a good job on broadleaf weeds, not on grasses, but it does a good job on broadleaf weeds and that can be sprayed. I know it can be quite pricey. So that is something to be aware of, but it is a non-chemical weed control spray. I guess if you, because acetic acid is vinegar, that's yep. basically what we have in our kitchen. Um, so that is another option, yes. But if, if you can get it, I know there has been times in the past it's been hard to find right. and it has it can be on the pricey side. Having said that, if you're just doing a little strip down yeah. either side, you're actually not spraying a lot of acres. You know, it may not be. Um, you wouldn't, it would be a little hard to use that on a big scale for a sure. lot of acres. It would economically, be, economically yeah. it would be hard to use that. Yeah. And, and I think the big thing to remember is that <laughs> technically and you, you need to be using a product that has a, uh, a label, labeled use. So some people will go and concoct uh, their own uh, mixture of. with acetic acid in it. Yeah. And technically that would, uh, would not be appropriate. Yes, yes, because the, the acetic acid that is registered for weed control is actually has a, a, a label, the same as any of these um, on the slide here have, have a label. They're registered with the PMRA, which is the Pest Management Regulatory Agency. And so everything that John Gawlowski has talked about, um, if Vikram is going to talk to you about, um, is if he's going to talk to you about um, fungicides, those are registered through PMRA and they have a number, like a like a registration number. And so yes, even if you're using something like uh, acetic acid or vinegar, you should be using something that is registered through PMRA and is actually it's been because it's been properly tested. It's been it it's been tested properly and we know it's safe, especially yep. when we're dealing with these crops. We want to be doing the right things. Yep. Cool. Right on. Okay. So, now that we have controlled the weed, that's not a problem anymore. No. <laughs> <laughs> the problem is uh, how to and when to plant. Right. And I am going to get back to the slide I want. Seed versus trans transplants. Yep. What's yeah. more economical? Well, I, I, again, <laughs> I, I think if, if we start out the idea of, you know, when are we going to plant? You, you want to have soil temps over 60 Fahrenheit uh, for for growth to, uh, to to be reasonable and uh, maybe not just reasonable for, for growth to be the best and that's whether you're uh, direct seeding or transplanting. It's not to say you can't do it when it's cooler, but that that's ideal. Uh, Tom, now, do you want to go back up to that display settings and switch? Oh yeah, my bad. Yep. Sorry, Lori. No worries. No yeah. My apologies. So basically, uh, soil temps between as high as 95 and down to uh, 75 are, are going to be just ideal for germination. Now, that's pretty warm. So you won't want to plant in late April? 
Right. And and the, the maturity, again, that's where you have to think of your varieties, uh, day frost-free days to maturity. Because, you know, it's not like we're going out seeding uh, wheat or something and uh, we got some uh, wiggle room here. Like, it, it's a warm season crop here and it, uh, yeah, we, we just can't go in too early. Um, now, when it comes to how is it planted, the, the majority of uh, commercial uh, crops are direct seeded in Manitoba. The transplanting that goes on, I'm not saying there's no transplanting that goes on, but it's a smaller percentage than, uh, than the direct seeded acres. Um, now, if, if you are seeding and you're, you're talking about standard uh, vine types, you're probably going to need in the range of two to four pounds of seed an acre. And if you're buying uh, squash or pumpkin seed, you're going to quickly see that that is a few bucks for seed. Um, so, yeah, be, be conscious of not, uh, not squandering your seed. So if you're growing a semi-bush type, uh, not quite your standard, but not quite a bush either, it's going to run a bit, but not be a uh, full runner. Uh, you might need three to four pounds an acre. And if it's a smaller bush type, like some of the zucchinis are, you're uh, going to be up to uh, four to six pounds of seed per acre. And depth-wise, a, a good target is one inch, again, depending on moisture or your availability to irrigation. Because um, again, you'd, you'd really want, in a perfect world, to put some moisture on it uh, once you've seeded. Um, now transplanting, the idea with transplanting is to put them in the ground when they're not so big that they're going to suffer in the ground. So, you know, if you're growing for your garden and you transplant it three or four times and it winds up in a 10 gallon uh, pot or something that you can dig with a spade in your garden, well, that's an all fine and dandy but you're not going to be digging that into a field a uh, hundred thousand times if you're, if you're transplanting into a field. So my suggestion is to go with uh, trays that have 128 cells. That's fairly small, but that's going to allow your transplant to be small. So you have to time your uh, planting in such a way uh, so that your transplant is not overly big when uh, you're targeting a uh, transplanting date. Um, start seedlings, again, depending on variety, sort of in that uh, three to four weeks, could be as little as two weeks sometimes, depending on variety. Um, but like I was saying, you wanna minimize root damage and any uh, damage to the tops. Uh, if you're doing using mechanical transplanters, uh the the more top growth there is the more likely you are to uh to be damaging uh damaging it uh so what's a uh ideal size for a transplant okay well I, I, again that's going to depend on the uh on the crop but uh no more than uh than sort of four inches at the max kind of thing you know in my opinion um some if you went to cells that were uh bigger trays that had fewer uh fewer cells you might get away with a little bigger plant but i think you'd suffer in the long run in transplanting something that big transplant shock yeah and potential damage so when it comes to spacing again i'll go back to those uh types. If it's a standard type, I'd be looking at uh, sort of three or sorry, four to five feet between uh, between plants in the row. A semi-bush type could be a foot and a half to two feet as well as if it was a bush type. Um, now, between the physically between the rows, this is going to uh, to become a different story here. Uh, standard types, like look at that range, five to 10 feet. 
like uh, pumpkins, if it's a standard pumpkin, I, I mean, you're you're gonna want room for it to grow, to run, and uh, be out towards that uh, that wider end of that ten feet. If it's uh, some of these uh, new uh, smaller squashes, like some of the butternuts, um, you're going to want to be down, maybe not right at five feet, but you know closer to that end of the spectrum. So it's going to depend a lot on what uh, what you're growing. And the semi bush type sort of four to five feet and the small bush type sort of three to four feet between the rows. Um, I, I, I think if we get to a point now where we've kind of talked about how we're we're doing things. One of the one of the issues we should talk about are diseases. Now, what diseases are going to affect uh, affect the uh, pumpkin and uh, and squash? And if you give me a second here, we're gonna no we're gonna switch to just to reiterate uh, some of the uh, points that uh, John Gablowski had raised about uh, the wilt in uh, the cucurbits. The uh, cucumber and the melons, they have uh, an issue or major issue with the uh, wilting. It is caused by a bacterium called uh, Irvinia. And in the melons and cucs, the wilting is very rapid. So one day you come and the plant looks good, Two, three days later when you visit, the plants may be wilting. And it could be something similar to, uh, you know, some uh, root uh, has been damaged by a cutworm or something. Uh, but the pumpkins and the squashes, they don't have uh, that much of a problem with the uh, wilting. If they do get infected, they have a very slow and extended uh, wilting period, and sometimes it could be confused with the uh, fusarium wilting in uh, the large plants. So one of the best thing is to uh, bring the sample, including the roots, but not the whole vine, and uh, we can try to isolate uh, and identify the problems. <clears throat> so uh, an important thing, uh, I'll be listing some of these uh, uh, diseases that uh, we may sometimes see in uh, Manitoba, uh, either in the commercial or in small gardens. And here it is the uh, bacterial disease which affects the leaves as leaf spots. One of the very good identifying feature is the uh, light green halo around the spots. And these then later become uh, larger and may even fall off uh, uh, and giving a whole kind of a appearance. They also infect the uh, fruits. And here you can see either uh, sunken or spots which have a uh, dark brown halo around it. So may not be affecting the yield at the fruit infection level, but certainly reduces the marketability. And uh, this can also lead to secondary infection with the other pathogens and uh, lead to storage rotting. And here are some of the other pictures <clears throat> which are showing you the bacterial spotting with the water soaked or greasy kind of appearance around it. And here are the other spots uh, which uh, are showing up in the uh, fruits, uh, not marketable at all. Uh, how do you manage? So it is a seed borne problem. And uh, so if possible, get uh, good seed. Uh, saved seed may not be very helpful. Crop rotation is very important. And in some cases, copper fungicides have been known to reduce the severity of the problem. It is not uh, uh, highly effective, but it is uh, the only uh, chemical that may be available. 
unless you are willing to put some antibiotics. Okay, good air movement in the crop canopy is very important because the bacteria love wet leaves. And so uh, when there is a rain or you have irrigated your field, uh, do not walk through uh, because you can carry the uh, bacteria to the other plants. <clears throat> Sclerotinia rot is another big problem that happens when you have warm conditions and there is a lot of moisture within the crop canopy. The plants are growing really beautifully and suddenly you see your new fruits are uh, rotting in the fields. Uh, this can be a big problem if you are growing uh, the crop in uh, after you have uh, grown say carrots which are susceptible to it or you have had uh, beans which are also susceptible to it and uh, so any susceptible crop that you grow and you have the uh, sclerotia in the field it can be a big problem so again uh, air movement is very helpful so the spores don't uh, uh, get uh, onto the uh, foliage or on the fruits to rot. There are some fungicides which are available. There are some biologicals which are, uh, in my opinion, quite helpful. So there is Contans, which is a uh, fungus which controls the uh, sclerotia very effectively. Double nickel and serenade are also quite uh, helpful. Uh, but uh, when the disease pressure is high, they probably may not work as well. <clears throat> Here are some of the other crops that if you are growing in rotation can be an issue because uh, they also get infected. Here is a lettuce head, uh, which is uh, with the sclerotinia growing on it. And soybean, here you can see the resting bodies, sclerotia, which if left in the ground uh, will be available to infect next year. Next is the powdery mildew disease. And this one also is very commonly seen, usually uh, towards the later part of the season. And it can uh, basically kill the leaves and the foliage. And uh, basically when you don't have much leaves, your productivity uh, is going to be much uh, reduced. Uh, here, uh, it is very common and can become very severe. Relative humidity, uh, high, is helpful. It is warm, it is helpful, but it can also uh, be a problem uh, when it is uh, warm and dry, because once the infection happens, the fungus loves some dry conditions. When you have rain or overhead irrigation, it is not very helpful to the powdery mildew disease. So, maybe a way to reduce it, but it will move the inoculum somewhere else. Uh, the mean temperature, uh, 68 to 80 degrees, but uh, infection can occur from say 50 to 90. So it is uh, quite widely uh, adapted. Uh, the plants uh, often uh, do not get affected till after the fruit initiation because in some of these, we have the petals uh, needed for infection. Susceptibility of uh, the uh, leaves uh, is greatest from the 16 to 23 days after they have unfolded. It means when the leaves open uh, and there is powdery mildew spore, that can get infected. Downy mildew, is present, but it is usually on cukes and not so much on uh, the uh, pumpkins. But I just wanted to show you what the disease looks like and what it can do. So in here, it is uh, not very commonly seen on the uh, pumpkins. It requires uh, cool nights with the fog or rain. And uh, the spots look yellow they have restriction of uh, not crossing the big veins. And uh, as the disease progresses, these spots turn dark brown and may drop off 
from the leaf uh, because of the defoliation or because of the leaf death the productivity is uh, not good so how do you differentiate between downy mildew and powdery mildew here is a very good example uh, yellowing and uh, no powder whereas the powdery mildew as the name says there is powder and you can see it on both the top and the bottom in the downy mildew you can see some uh, restricted uh, growth restriction by the veins and uh, here is another good picture uh, restricted by the veins and here is the powdery mildew on the right side bottom uh, where the uh, fungus is growing on top of the veins so that is very easy differentiation the good thing is some of the chemicals that we use for powdery mildew and downy mildew are common and so the fungicides are effective uh, this is another uh, important uh, disease and here the uh, most important thing is it leads to fruit rotting it will also uh, lead to uh, the leaves getting affected the stems they show uh, when it is humid it has some uh, honeydew kind of uh, uh, leakage and this oozing carries a lot of spores and this gummy substance is what gives the name uh, as the uh, gummy stem blight so once the uh, gummy substance is gone it will have some pycnidia that you can see on the older uh, stems and this also leads to uh, fruit rotting and that is uh, what we are more worried about so it spreads with the warm and wet uh, weather it will move with the uh, soil and also by air when there is a splash dispersal after irrigation or when there is rain uh, so when the fruit gets infected it will be called black rot it doesn't look black here right now but after some time i'll show you uh, it does turn black at this time it has a reddish brown color and this you can see in the field itself uh, when the infection uh, is uh, you can say uh, you know uh, in the field uh, it shows that it is petrified or woody appearance but uh, when you bring it back into your uh, storage then you have to make sure that the conditions are good otherwise you will have the real black rot and uh, there are some more pictures here the edges of the uh, leaves will have this kind of uh, uh, rotting or uh, discoloration or browning um, it could be a few other things so it is helpful to confirm what this uh, particular disease is going to be uh, crop rotation is uh, very very helpful and uh, fungicides are quite uh, useful uh, good thing is some of the fungicides used for uh, controlling this disease are also effective for uh, the powdery mildew and the downy mildew so uh, that way easier management here is a list of uh, uh, the fungicides it's a big list and uh, please make sure that you remember the names because when i meet you next i'll ask you the <laughs> names of at least three <laughs> okay and here you can see i have listed uh, what the name of the fungicides are what the actives are and what companies are producing them and what diseases they are controlling pm is powdery mildew gummy stem blight is the other disease we talked fusarium <clears throat> is uh, uh, also a disease that can be controlled gummy stem blight powdery mildew alternaria is a minor disease but also important in some cases and you have gray mold control powdery mildew gray mold uh, and so here uh, you have listed as downy mildew as as well and there's an added list of uh, more fungicides quadris elatus approvia diplomat 
and uh, vivando and fracture fracture is a biological which controls and very effective against uh, powdery mildew i had used it in my field trial and i liked it it was uh, pretty good i have marked a uh, bravo uh, differently because it used to be uh, registered for downy mildew and powdery mildew also but it has now a more restricted label for use on vegetables so it is okay to use against anthracnose and scab but it is not registered against uh, downy mildew and powdery mildew uh, against the uh, cucurbits including pumpkins and squashes so uh, what are the reasons behind it i don't know but if you have uh, to control anthracnose you may be able to also have some effect on these two other diseases so uh, these are some uh, this is the black rot that i was talking about and uh, so uh, whenever we are talking about fruit rots this is the problem of uh, store management and uh, if there has been a, a wounding uh, from uh, handling or the beetles have been uh, feeding and creating trouble and so it is important that fruit management is important so how do you control these harvest only fully ripened fruit good crop rotation good drainage water management and control the beetles there are some good photographs that i have this is what i had in my cold storage and uh, initially i saw this fungus uh, infecting only lightly i just wanted to see how it will progress i let it go and so basically in this container the whole fruit just collapsed so a few of my uh, hatrite uh, friends have been harvesting and keeping the squashes or pumpkins in the coolers and i think that isn't a good idea and uh, so uh, some of these uh, fruits need to be stored in warmer conditions and not in a cold storage so uh, i will show you another beautiful picture from my cool storage and uh, here you can see all kinds of uh, fungi uh, this is not the stage uh, that you ever see but i wanted to take pictures and so i let it continue here the gray ones are the uh, didemela or the black rot the light gray here is the elton area and here is the uh, fusarium and so you have all kind of uh, things so for a pathologist this is a beautiful picture <laughs> okay now coming to a non disease as uh, tom was saying that uh, the uh, you can say uh, uh, irrigation is uh, quite important and if uh, the crop is not properly irrigated the soil stay dry then we sometimes get into physiological disorder which causes uh, these bumps and uh, if you have a few of these it's not a big deal but if you have large ones and quite uh, uh, all around the fruit then i think it doesn't uh, go well for selling it may be okay to carve out uh, but uh, not uh, very good i wonder if plastic mulch uh, which will uh, facilitate uh, moisture retention in the ground will help it but i have not done any uh, experiment to see this and then i wonder if uh, uh, tom has uh, some comments on uh, the harvesting storage management of uh, some of the fruits so the storability is uh, improved yeah, well yeah the, when it comes to the idea of uh, storing winter squash or, or pumpkins the, we didn't get into it too much but you know curing is, is a big uh, is a big factor there um, you could cure in the field 
uh, if the temperatures uh, are right and it's uh, it, it's relatively dry and it's uh, it's not too cold, but you, you could also cure in storage. If I were going to cure in storage, I'd be looking at uh, sort of 10 to 20 days in storage at uh, maybe as high as 75 to 80 Fahrenheit, um, that kind of thing. Uh, Curing will uh, harden the shell and uh, help uh, any uh, any small wounds heal. Uh, it uh, it will though, you're, you, because you're using some some uh, warm temperatures, you're going to lose a little weight. You're going to lose some water there. Um, and uh, here, just basically what I was talking about, you could cure in the field if uh, if it's warmer and drier. Uh, Vikram uh, is Mr. Celsius there, so I had uh, suggested 75 to 80, and he's suggesting 80 to 85. Um, and uh, that I I would uh, agree uh, with with going as high as 85, certainly. Um, so Celsius pushing up towards 30, 26 to 30, um, for, for curing like, and, and then for storage, basically, I'd be, uh, be looking at, uh, taking that temperature down into the fifties, maybe a high 50 down to a low 50, somewhere in that range with a relative, uh, relative humidity in the, uh, in in sort of the 70 ish percent range um and look at that vikram and i agree on that that's good um yeah i why don't we leave it at that was there anything uh i, I think we're going a little long here so what i'd like to do Lori, were there any questions that had come in that we could uh try to take rather than me continue to ramble? No, um, I think you guys covered everything very, very well, so we don't have any questions. Oh my Lord, that's either really good or really bad. I'm not sure, okay. Well, if, if anyone has any questions, I'd encourage you to type them in the chat right away. Um, just while we're, uh, before we uh, wrap up and check the question and answer one more time, I'd like to uh, thank uh, those who have attended and uh, though also remember their recorded links are sent out uh, to attendees so you can watch it at your leisure if you want to uh, get a, a rehash of uh, any of the information or if you miss one you can uh, go and watch it from start to finish if you'd like. Any uh, questions Lori before I wrap up? No, you can wrap it up. Okay. Well, thanks, uh, thanks everyone for taking the time to be with us today and and over the uh, the March of uh, this year when we every Wednesday since we ran the uh, series, uh, the reception to the webinars has been very good. Uh, I don't know the details yet. They'll be coming out in the next couple of months, but there will be webinars coming in the future. So stay tuned for that. And again, if you uh, are a certified crop advisor you're, uh, and submitted your number, your registration number when you uh, registered uh, for the webinar, those that number will be sent on on your behalf. So thanks very much. If uh, any of you wish to cover any other crop uh, in details like this, uh, please let us know and we will prepare a webinar which we can share at a later date. Yeah, like we chose sweet corn and uh, pumpkin and squash for this March webinar series, but uh, yeah, uh, pick a, let us know your, your favorite crop. Uh, certainly you'd have uh, email contacts. Uh, you can uh, send it to, to anyone uh, of us and uh, let us know. So th thanks very much for that and uh, have yourself a great rest of the day. Thank you very much.
right? 